Welcome to J is for Justice podcast. If live breaking news and following true crime is your thing, then please consider subscribing to my channel. And if you like what you see in my videos, please consider giving them a thumbs up. Hey guys, I just had a major Roberta moment. Like I hit the intro and then I didn't come back. And then I looked up and there was a blank screen. So welcome to J is for Justice. This is kind of how I roll sometimes. Who am I kidding? Most of the time. Welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, thank you for being here and thank you for stopping in. If you could give this video a like and consider subscribing, it would be great. We've got Summer Lou and Bella Rose over to my right. And uh, that is called Doggy Cam. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you, Cheryl T. and Incognito Potato for being here. And thank you, all the Roberters. The Roberters are the jolly ones in green. <laughs> jolly. I forgot to add my new sound bites. So I guess that will be for tomorrow's live, which I guess I can tell you about now. Tomorrow, we're going to be doing kind of a deep dive on the Idaho 4 case. Not really diving deep into people or doing anything crazy like that. We're just going to be, um, I have the um, food truck video and the audio um, is much better. It's like, I know summer's going crazy. Um, the audio is much better. And also it's zoomed in on the square that we want to watch and it's super interesting. So we're going to do that. And then, um, you know, talk about anything else that's going on. They're still looking for the white car. I mean, there's so much to talk about, but then yet there's so much not new, you know. So that's tomorrow's live. That's for Sunday night. Um, so, yeah, Saturday night. We're doing Friday night on Saturday night. And Summer wants a mic. I mean, shit. What are you going to do? She was so quiet until I came live. Now she, like, wants to. Come here. Come here. She won't jump out. Now she wants the spotlight. So Summer Lou. This one's for you, girl. What's your name? <laughs> Summer Lou. <laughs> okay, so hopefully she's quiet so we can do our updates. Let's get into it, shall we, folks? <laughs> she says yes. She says hell to the yes. <laughs> oh, my God. I can't believe it. And HJ's not here tonight, so... She'll definitely have to replay this one. Oh, now she's jumped. <laughs> oh, my God. That's a that's a clip right there. Oh, my gosh. You are too much. What do you want? Come here. Come over here. What do you want? Did you guys see that? <laughs> she was. Look at this. Now she's over here. All right. Enjoy doggy cam, guys. Let me. Hey, you be nice to her. Let me know if you see Bella getting bullied. Okay, let's get into our first update. We're going to get this one just right out of the way. Scott Peterson, I don't know if you've heard the latest, but we're going to go over it anyways. Not a whole lot, but we are waiting for the judge to decide if he's going to get a new trial. And she came out, she, there was a scheduled hearing and everything that was supposed to be held last Friday. And it didn't happen because the judge canceled it. So let's see why the judge canceled it and what she says now. will no longer be holding a hearing to announce their decision. The hearing was scheduled for Friday of this week, but now the judge says she's going to issue a written decision by December 16th. Hmm. Peterson was convicted of killing God his wife Lacey and their unborn son back in 2004. That case did go back to court though recently in 2020 after claims of juror misconduct. I mean, that is it. The, the judge said, oh, there's no need for a hearing. So what do you guys think that that means? Do you think that that means no case is perfect? He's going to get one. What do you why not have the hearing unless she wasn't ready then? I'm not sure, but crazy seeing the mugshot you see on the screen right now and then looking at my thumbnail. That's the latest 
mugshot of Scott Peterson and he's looking a little, he's looking a little old. I think San Quentin, but you know what? For someone being in San Quentin, he don't look bad, right? Look at the girls putting on a nice show for you guys tonight. Usually they are sleeping. <laughs> Wait, hold on. I have a sound bite for that. Fucking piece of shit. Oops. Did that say it out loud? Oh, was my guest audio on? Whoops. <laughs> I have to get a new FDO. My FDO is gone. Because the fuck directly off is so fitting sometimes. That's how it and played out. Roberta. <laughs> okay, next update. So we wait for the judge. She's got until the 16th. And we wait. Now, we're going to get the messed up part out of the way. Which, this is just beyond messed up. I had no idea... It was this far spread. So um, I'm sure we're all aware that there was an electrical grid that was um, attacked in North Carolina. More North Carolina. All their schools were shut down. Everything. The hospitals running on generators. Because somebody or more than somebody shot them which kept them out of power for I think some of them are still out of power now we're going to watch a video first on that but now I found this article um, from December the 8th two days ago for the Pacific Northwest also being attacked and I hadn't seen that Hold on one second. Hey, Summer, be gentle. It's like having toddlers here. Oh, I have a surprise. We have a Grady Judd update. Ah, we can maybe do that over coffee tomorrow. I'm just checking something before we... Okay, so we're going to watch this video on the electrical grid. This is the one from, oh, Jesus, here comes Eagle Eight. Are you kidding me right now? Can't make this shit up. Okay, so this is the North Carolina one. And then we're going to read about the Pacific Northwest. Because this worries me. TV, it's, uh, we have to stand TV. down. North Carolina when two substations were attacked now have the lights back on gunfire damaged the facilities more than 45,000 Duke Energy customers were in the dark and schools were closed all week in Moore County officials say the substations were intentionally targeted and the FBI is assisting in the investigation <coughs> the FBI is also investigating a separate incident in South Carolina authorities say someone pulled up to a Duke Energy facility before opening fire and driving away <laughs> There were no power outages reported. It's unclear if this was a targeted attack. For a deeper analysis on this, I'm joined by Anurag Sriv Srivastava. Okay. This is downright scary. Is it not? Did you guys hear that there was also um, an electrical grid in South Carolina that was attacked? North Carolina... And then there was also a report here in the Tampa Bay area back in September that there were um, that there were outages here in Tampa Bay. Five were attacked back in September. So I think it's important to you know be updated on what's going on just in case. Something happens. We need to be prepared. 
you know, generators. So we're not caught off guard. So we're not like, oh my God. I mean, yes, it would be scary. Absolutely. It's scary that that can even happen. But the more prepared we are, the less we'll feel panicked, if that makes sense. I mean, that's really the only thing I can think of to say regarding something like this, because it's so out of our control. You know what I mean? Like we have so little control as to the outcome of anything. (laughs) So I think it's important to control what we can and just roll with it. You know what I mean? Like there's nothing else we can do, peeps. But be aware, you know, and not be scared. But um, let's listen. This is um, Anurag Srizavasta. He is a chairperson and professional at large at Lane Department of Computer Science and Electrical Engineering at West Virginia University. So in other words, he's super duper smart. And they're going to and they're asking him, what can we do? to is there anything that they can do to protect us from this he is the chairperson and professor at large at lane department of computer science and electrical engineering at west virginia university um Anurag, so we have these two instances in, in uh, instances they may or may not be related um oh come on why is the energy grid so vulnerable <laughs> well i would say that you know grid is not designed for these kind of uh, extreme events <laughs> We design it for some kind of failure and make it reliable, but not uh, these kind of extreme events. And it will be vulnerable uh, because it's physically exposed, you know, so everything is out there. And uh, not only these kind of events, but also weather events uh, and also cyber attacks. And so what needs to be improved to make these? You know what the look on his face says to me? The look on his face says to me, there's not a damn thing we can do. There's not a damn thing we can do. Because it's over our heads. This is like, obviously we're not prepared or this shit wouldn't happen. But why aren't these like, when I heard about the five in Tampa Bay that were attacked, They said that, and I can't find the damn video now. It's like gone. But I'm going to keep looking for it. But there were five of them. And it said that they actually got past the fence. (laughs) Cognito. Defeated. (laughs) Better. So a lot can be done, you know, uh, and there are some efforts already taking place as we see increase in uh, weather events and also cyber events. So I would say that, you know, first thing is reinforcing critical substation uh, and, and we need to identify those, which critical assets those are. Second thing, we need to put more sensors and real time monitoring so that we can send alerts to operators, to police, and uh, and everyone who need to respond to these kind of events. Third, which is most important, is we need to change our thinking, which were initially reliability driven, to resilience driven, design, training, planning, and operation. And and there's a lot. In other words, we've ignored this for so long, like just thinking that those barbed wire fence were enough. I mean, let's go back to that aerial view. I mean, I can't tell you how many of these little substations are everywhere. I mean, even out in the country and there's there's nothing out there. And there's literally barbed wire fence all around them. So it's a little little scary thinking. But this guy's really smart. It's interesting what he says. Keeps applying the power grid, assuming that few things will fail. It does not take care of these kind of extreme events. And it used to be rare. And Anurag, let me just interrupt for a moment. Is it also, in addition to making them more resilient, is it also the case that these electric facilities or these uh, are done on a state by state basis? There's no uniform um, uh, regime for hardening these targets. 
I would say yes. Yeah. So most uh, of these investment to to make it, you know, more monitored and more reinforced is driven by each utility and it might be multiple state by, uh, you know, one electric grid operators. Not to change the subject, but did you see the city he's in? Mullins, West Virginia. You can't make it up. You just can't. And as they go for upgrading these facilities, uh, they, you know, most in most of the cases, they need to go to regulators and ask to increase the, you know, approve this cost so that they can get the bill paid by ratepayers. So it is, it is, it is a little bit different by state by state uh, by grid operators. And and finally, the the most recent infrastructure bill had some money that went towards upgrading the national power grid. How much? Um, how important and and helpful will that be? <laughs> this will definitely help. I mean, we are talking about uh, biggest man-made machine ever. I mean, the electric grid. Uh, just talking about substation, which uh, had this uh, attack. You know, there are like fifty-five thousand substations. So even with did he say fifty five thousand substations? Are you fucking kidding me? It's a attack. You know there are like fifty five thousand substations. So was it, it fifty five hundred or fifty five thousand? I don't know. Sixty five billion dollar of infrastructure bill going towards the grid. It's not enough to you know to make the complete grid. Very, oh very my God! Present. Sixty-five billion, he says, is not enough to get it to where we can be protected. So <laughs> that really, I know. I'm glad I'm not that smart too, because <laughs> I don't think I could handle knowing all this stuff and not being able to do anything about it, like just watching it happen. And being like, they could do this, they could do that, and they're not. So, yeah, it's it's pretty scary. So I think generators, like, having those little, like, uh, things charged, the little power boxes, 55,000. Thanks, Mary. Mary, Mary, why you bugging? We're not screwed. We're not screwed. We'll be fine. This has happened before. It's happened before. We just have to be prepared for it. <clears throat> it's just crazy that it's not a cyber thing. It's an actual in-person thing. That's what scares me. Because who in the hell is doing it? And then now we move on to the Pacific Northwest. Where two days ago, Washington law enforcement sources say they received a memo from the FBI warning them about attacks to the power stations in the Pacific Northwest. Crit critical infrastructure around the country has been placed on alert. But um, even though they got this memo, okay, here's what the memo read. Power companies in Oregon and Washington have reported physical attacks on substations. So it's not just a warning. It freaking happened out there, too. Using hand tools, arson, firearms, and metal chains, possibly in response to an online call for attacks on critical infrastructure. In recent attacks, criminal actors bypass security by cutting the fence links, <laughs> lighting nearby fires, shooting equipment from a distance, or throwing objects over the fence and onto equipment. Some of those attacks happened in the last couple weeks. One of the largest power providers in the state, Puget Sound Energy, told King 5 Wednesday that two incidents occurred at their stations in late November. And they say they're aware of the recent attacks on power systems and take these very seriously. And they're monitoring their infrastructure and can confirm they had two incidents late November at two different substations. Roberta. So, on Thanksgiving morning, they had one in Clackamas, Oregon. It was deliberate. There's no question that somebody meant to do it, said Doug Johnson, senior spokesperson for the Bonneville Power Administration. 
He said it looked like they used something sharp to cut through a fence that's designed to keep people out. And he also said this can have a really bad effect on a lot of people. So four days in after the North Carolina attack, they got tens of thousands of people back up. And then it says, if you are aware of anyone targeting any kind of infrastructure, you are advised to call local LE or the FBI Seattle. Now, here is the LE in North Carolina giving their latest update. This was three days ago. 45,000 customers lost power. And might I add that this was a Duke Energy infrastructure. And I have Duke Energy. Yay me. (laughs) All right. So here is the latest from the police there. Sheriff Fields, I'll report to you this afternoon that our investigation continues at a very fast pace. Uh, Sheriff's Office investigators, along with our partners in the FBI, the State Bureau of Investigation, continue to leave no stone unturned. Uh, We're looking at every angle. Our tip line has been very, very active in the last 24 hours. Uh, And I'll remind citizens that they continue to call in at 910-947-4444. That is a recorded line that they can leave an anonymous tip. Um, It comes out to all of us in, in investigations and we're able to get those tips real time as soon as they're recorded. And I would encourage people to continue to call. And um, our investigators, again, continue to work very, very long hours. We were able to uh, bring down the initial 45,000 customers affected on Sunday evening by 7,000 to about 38,000. I'm happy to say that today we we lowered that number again by about close to 3,000 more. So we're down to about 35,000 customers who are without power currently. The good news is we have communicated up to this point that we would expect the final customers to be back on sometime later on Thursday. Uh, We have made very good progress today and are moving that estimate up to Wednesday night. You know, it's just really nothing but a huge inconvenience. And just to, you know, scare us, it's it's terrorism. And what's terrorism? It's meant to scare you. We have a lot of terrorists here on YouTube. But that's what terrorism is. It's it's an act meant to freaking scare you. And, you know, it is scary. And what I what just popped in my head is, wow, what about all of the elderly people and the ill people that need oxygen and are, you know, all these machines? So... All right, next update is a Uvalde update. We haven't heard much about Uvalde lately, but two days ago, it came out that Uvalde County Sheriff Ruben Nolasco knew about the calls for shots fired on campus the day of the shooting, but diverted to a shooting reported less than a half mile from the school. Let's listen. Another Uvalde County official is facing scrutiny for their actions at Robb Elementary tonight. Uvalde Sheriff has said he thought his response to the shooting was adequate. Tonight, CNN reports Uvalde Sheriff Ruben Nolasco (coughs) knew about the calls for shots fired on campus, but still diverted to a shooting at a home nearby. That's where he found a woman shot in the head. The shooter's grandmother, who identified her grandson as her attacker, the video shows the sheriff arrived at Robb Elementary by 1149, 16 minutes after the gunman entered the school. CNN says Nolasco mentioned to DPS he was coming, but they needed to figure out who was in charge. Keep up to date with all of San Antonio. Can you believe that? Weather. Guys, he heard about it and he was like, uh, y'all are going to have to figure it out because uh, I'm going over here to this shooting. So figure out who's in charge. What? You're right. It isn't an inconvenience. You're right. You're right. It's winter. I forget that. I'm sorry, Cheryl. 
Auntie Cheryl's right. She's like, dude, this is more than an inconvenience, Jay. <laughs> They're talking to a neighbor dog. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, that is just outrageous. Figure out who's in charge, guys. So it just keeps getting worse. Before we know it, they're just going to throw them all out and start over. This is the sheriff. This is the sheriff. Okay, so the next one we're going to go to is Athena Strand. Heartbreaking, heartbreaking case. Um. I do have the affidavit. I'm not going to read through it tonight. I'll probably do that in another live because it's pretty long. And I'd like to talk about it more. But I did want to show a clip of her mom. Because um, her mom spoke for the first time three days ago at a candlelight memorial. And this was at Cottondale Baptist Church. And little Athena, her killer, is saying that he hit the little girl. And then she said, I'm going to tell my dad that you hit me and that he strangled her. Now, that makes zero sense to me. Um, but we are going to read through that affidavit. I just don't want to get into a deep dive on that. It's just absolutely horrific. Her mom breaks my heart. But I wanted to at least, you know, acknowledge this because it's, it's important because this is crazy. He was bringing a gift. It was a <laughs> gift for the little girl so let's let's listen y'all are amazing people and i don't know how to thank you guys for all that y'all have done for my family but especially for my baby and i just want y'all to know that she was amazing and she would truthfully love every single one of you because she loves every human that she has ever met and every animal that she has ever met and i just wanted to say thank you all for all of the volunteers and just coming out and supporting her even if you guys did not look for her i know people were sharing her story all over social media and i just want to keep her face and her story alive because i want everyone to know athena for athena and not for what someone tried to make her out to be because she's the best little girl. She really was. And this just... <laughs> Y'all are making me cry saying Athena's strong, so I, I needed to be strong for her because I figured I won't be strong by the end of this. Yes, ma'am. I know she is. And I hope she waits for me, baby. Thank you all. And please, I don't care if it's five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, remember Athena Strand. Thank you, guys. The Club Q shooting session. Don't be jealous that I've been chatting online with babes all day.
I was muted because Bella was barking. Jesus Christ. Sorry. Three-hour tour. A three-hour tour. Bye, Jennifer. <laughs> okay, I'm back. So really quick, I don't even know. After Athena, um, I just said it was heartbreaking. I have no words. It's just super sad. And it's disgusting to think that these contracted workers muted looking ass ah! these contracted workers you know they should be doing background checks on them so I'm curious to find out what happens with this and then I said I wanted to get into the next update I wanted to just play the update every day I'm doing um, updates from Moscow because yesterday they said be careful of misinformation and to only get them information from them. So they have started a YouTube channel. They didn't have one before. So he puts them on there or they whoever does. And this is the one from today. It's not very long or lengthy, but I just want to cover it because I want to keep up on everything. So we're going to listen to this. It's pretty short. It's a minute long. Chief Fry. Tell us about the weekend. So many people in town. What's happening as far as public safety during this time? This is a very important weekend for the university. It's our commencement weekend, and um, we're going to have a lot of officers around. We're going to have a lot of Idaho State Police around. Um, you'll see us both at the commencement as well as uh, just around town providing safety. Where are we at in the investigation right now? We're working steady on the investigation still. We're still receiving um, tips. We're still receiving items in um, from, you know, back down at the lab. Um, things are continuing. We're still pushing forward. And um, it's worth the normal process of um, investigation. We're still doing a lot of interviews and uh, I'm talking to a lot of people. What about the number of people involved at this point? We still have the same amount of staff. Um, Idaho State Patrol, um, our local, um, Moscow Police Department detectives and um, FBI, um, not only here locally, but still across our nation, across our state. Okay, so it's not really um, no information, but they're investigating. We're not going to hear what exactly is going on, right? But I think we need to be careful because this is, there's been some time that's passed and there's been a lot of misinformation already on social media. So I think the responsible thing to do is, you know, not only wait for LE to confirm things or to disregard things and say, you know, we've ruled that out or whatever. Um, we know we're not going to get the truth from them right now. They're doing an extensive investigation into a quadruple murder, but I think it's important to not make the Idaho Four a game of Clue, like a game of online Clue. Like if you want to play a game, go buy fucking Hunter Killer. Because these are real people. It's not fucking Colonel Mustard in the fucking study. You know what I'm saying? It just gets to be ridiculous. Yes, I looked at Jeremy. Absolutely. I think a lot of people looked at Jeremy because he put himself out there. But but people are digging up neighbors' names and putting them out there. I don't know if you guys have seen this, but it's been sent to me, and I'm 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 shocked. I mean, I am, but I'm not. But it's sick. And thank you, Sweet Cheeks, for being a member for two months. And Erica Reagan, thank you for subscribing. But. It's not an online game of Clue. Like, that's what these people turn the shit into. A fucking game of Clue. Is it this neighbor? They have this car. And then people are pulling up Google. There's another thing. They're pulling up, like, Google uh, Maps or Google Earth or Google Images or whatever. And they're um, saying, oh, there's this white car. There's a white Hyundai. Do you know how many white Hondas there are? But then they don't look at the date. They don't look at the date of the image, you know, 2021. Like that's not now. They're not in real time. So yes, there's been a fake scream video that someone heard a scream. It's like Summer Wells all over again. 
<laughs> what, Rue? Thank you, Carol H., for being a Roberta for 10 whole months. Holy shit. You're almost on your, <laughs> you're almost on your year mark. Yes, yeah, speak truth. I mean, if you guys know if someone puts out fake shit, speak it. Because it's not right. Did you hear that the chief wasn't even Roberta. aware that someone reported the door being open that night? Those guys are over their heads. Oh. No, but Michael, who said that? Have you ever thought that like even the stuff that maybe they've told the parents because they know they're doing interviews might not be everything? They don't have to tell <clears throat> the families everything. I mean, it's it's an investigation, and unfortunately, thank you, Carol H. Um, you know, you don't. Oh my God, are you serious, Phil? That's awful. Report that shit to YouTube as fake informa fake misinformation. I mean, that's just stupid. Like I said, this isn't a game of Clue. This is people's real lives. Ugh, the integrity on YouTube just never ceases to amaze. All right, guys, next update. And we will be talking about the Idaho 4 case tomorrow and going over more of that um, food truck video. So now our next update is going to be Brittany Griner. And we hear about what the conditions were for her over there in Russia. And we also hear that Brittany was able to call her father mid-flight. And then we hear about why she cut her hair, et cetera, et cetera. Let's listen about Brittany. Her father mid-flight as she returned to the U.S. This is according to the Democratic Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Leaf. And it comes as we're learning new details about Brittany Griner's life in a Russian penal colony. We've got some new video here we'll show you. This is her with, with short hair in her prison. Her lawyer telling ESPN that Griner cut her hair to survive the brutal Russian winter because there was no way to dry her hair. And she was freezing, an indication Griner thought she would be serving her sentence for many more months to come. We're learning that Griner also could not be forced to sew along with the other women because she was too tall, her hands were too big for the work. I want to go to T.J. Quinn, the investigative reporter and senior writer for ESPN, who's been breaking all of these details. Uh, T.J., you know, I mean, it, it is amazing. It gives you just a window into what she was living every day. What more are you learning about Griner's time? Okay, look at, at these college? pictures. Well, we, we have yet to hear from her, of course, but what her lawyer was saying to me and other people around her I've spoken to is that it could have been a lot worse. They were very concerned when she was moved from the relatively safe Hold on, wait for jail it. where she had been through her trial uh, to this penal colony. These are these colonies are descendants of the old Soviet gulags. They're work camps. Like you said, most of the women sit there and sew all day. Her job was carrying fabric around. Uh, there was concern that she could be a target. She is a six foot nine black lesbian from the United States and no one. Knew OK, that. wait a minute. I could just want to say carrying fabric around is is brutal work. I mean, I'm not trying to be an ass, but. Carrying fabric. What? <laughs> <laughs> Get treated like skunk. They were very concerned when she was moved from the relatively safer Moscow jail where she had been through her trial uh, to this penal colony. These are these colonies <coughs> are descendants of the old Soviet gulags. They're work camps. Like you said, most of the women sit there and sew all day. Her job was carrying fabric around. Uh, there was concern that she could be a target. She is a six foot nine black lesbian from the United States. And no one knew, could she be a target of another inmate, of a guard? What her lawyer was saying to me, and this is, she's speaking from Moscow. So 
you know, all due respect to her, you have to take a little grain of salt with it, uh, is that they assign somebody who spoke English to her to help show her the rules because it's very easy in these camps to to suddenly commit an infraction that gets your privileges taken away or put you put in solitary. Uh, but for the one month that she was there, she did okay. But you're right, she was looking for the long haul, even when she was in jail. I mean, does it really, do these pictures look that, I mean, I pictured it to be really bad, like where John McAfee was. That's how I pictured it to be horrible. But it doesn't look that bad. I mean, they got cute little curtains with pom-poms, like what the hell? There's a basketball hoop, but no ball. Her lawyers offered to bring her a ball. She said, I'm not ready to think about basketball. If I'm still here in the spring, bring it to me then. So, you know, it is amazing the details. So she didn't want a basketball and she was offered one because she wanted to just carry around fabric. And obviously important that you point out that Rush, that lawyer was speaking to you from, from Moscow. But Griner's lawyer also told you, I know, that the first promising sign came earlier this week, right? So not, not much of a warning, right? Earlier this week. And that quickly turned into concern about Griner's whereabouts. So what happened? Right. Well, they heard last week that something might be happening. So they got a little optimistic, guarded, as you would expect. Why did I hear like double or was that them? Now that should have been a great sign, but then they didn't hear from her or about her for days. Uh, she said little concerns like the fact that Brittany had broken her glasses while she was at the prison camp. They didn't know if she could see, if she could read. She said, we didn't know if she was getting food. So essentially no one slept because on one hand you can't account for her and you worry about her safety. But on the other hand, this might be the crucial step that actually gets right. her home. Wow, amazing. I mean, what is that? Look at that spread of food. What the fuck is that? Um, <laughs> that doesn't look like prison slop to me. But does it? <laughs> I'm sure that she, they don't like six foot nine black lesbians from America. I don't know, though. I just really don't know. <laughs> it does. It's a fucking buffet. <laughs> My God, potato. And this is after her hair was cut. Was this maybe something they gave her after she was released? She, it's a, it's a, I mean, no. Is it? Look at there's plants in the windows. It's all, it's all chill, like a little cafe. Those last details, just in those hours, not knowing where she was, it sort of leaves me speechless. TJ, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Objection. Thanks, Aaron. TJ breaking so many of those details. And I want to go now to one of Griner's teammates who helped lead the effort. Okay, we're not going to watch the teammate, but I was a little shocked at this. <laughs> I just, I, I, you would think that if it was propaganda, they would like make it look really bad, like, like this. This is where John McAfee was in Spain. Let's see if we can find a. Oh, my God. Someone already made a video on it, you guys. I don't think you have to say much. <laughs> There's already clip channels. Somebody made a video. But like this. I've been arrested 21 goddamn times in 11 countries. Um, 11 countries, right. That's what I wanted to know. Oh, I guess this isn't. Uh, yes. Okay. So, <laughs> number one, if you want to get arrested, uh, do not ever choose the Dominican Republic. I mean, <laughs> I have been in jails and I've been in jails and prisons and nothing can possibly <laughs> compare to the Dominican Republic. Now, if you are a connoisseur of jail time, oh, fuck yes, go there. <laughs> you know, it's, like a fine, it's like the fine um, line of... But for real, I mean, it, 
pom poms on the curtains, plants in the windows, full buffet. I'm just not so sure about all this. Okay, now we're going to get into the fun part because we're about to wrap this up, folks. And this is the funny part where I like to make you guys laugh because what we do is so sad and dark. So we're going to laugh a little bit. And whether you're a fan of Fox News or not, I really don't care. Okay. I'm not about, oh, I watch this news station because of this. I'm not political. I don't give a damn. I think they all lie. I think that I've already made that clear. And this is my opinion and my opinion only. Now, Fox News. (laughs) There's an AI program, a brand new one. And they're going to tell you about it a little bit. It's called Chat GPT. So if you if you like take yourself to one news thing and say, I'm only going to watch them, you're not going to get the whole fucking picture. So and you're not going to learn as much. So anyways. They asked this AI bot program to write a poem about the show and Geraldo Rivera was a, a guest and he weighs in kind of on the AI aspect with the media. And I think it's kind of interesting because. I think a lot of anchors are you know, a little bit worried that AI anchors are going to take over the news. They're already like in, in a couple news um, outlets, they've actually like AI'd their anchor in order to put out um, news reports 24-7 using her. So um, let's take a look at this because I think you guys will get a, get a kick out of it yet but the internet's going crazy okay graham can write really com- sorry here we go new artificial intelligence called chat gpt the program can write really complex essays books news articles and even computer code and it's really good we just- okay this is what terrifies me we had to try it for ourselves asking it to write a poem about this show <laughs> The five on Fox News is quite a sight with a panel that's always so bright. They entertain and inform with their banter and charm and have viewers tune in day and night. Well, inform and charm doesn't rhyme, so I'm not. Yeah, lousy rhyming. <laughs> yeah, bright and night is too far. So the, they're all scared of this AI, right? So they want to tear it apart, but listen. Exactly. Our other. jobs are safe. Yeah. <laughs> See? Not just text, though. These computer programs are really good at making fake For photos. Her. As if Geraldo doesn't have enough pictures of himself. That's not really a photo. We ran his selfies <laughs> through an AI processor, and this is what it came up with. It's pretty good. But mankind better be careful. Experts warn this thing has the potential to take your job. Kids can use these to cheat and have it write papers for them, where it can impersonate your friends to give up your passwords. Murder. And the biggest fear is AI becomes so smart, it finds a way to control humanity. Dana per- Perino. Mm. Are, is, are we making too big of a deal about this, or is this really a no. threat? No. I don't know. <laughs> I think yes and no. And I, I live in fear that I'm going to be the first person that airs a deep fake video <laughs> that, we, that, you all think, that we all think is real. Oh, my God. It seems like it comes. See, she's afraid. <laughs> oh, my God. I didn't listen to all of this. I, I, I admit, but I, I fucking love it. I love it. Potato. She's afraid that she's going to be the first one to air a deep fake that she thinks is real and everybody thinks is real and it's not. Yes and no. <laughs> and I, I live in fear that I'm going to be the first person that airs a deep fake video that, we, that you all think that we all think is real. That seems like it comes from a real source and maybe you double check it. Maybe that you triple check it. Be and classic you still if it happened to you. Do, it would be <laughs> right. That's, that's why I live in fear of it. So hopefully that we'll, we'll never do that. But I do think that that's coming. Yeah. As you can see here, how easy that is to do. Like if if you and I can just speak into this chatbot thing and ask them to write a poem, like what else will it be able to do very soon? So that's happening very quickly. I, I do think that really bad minimum wage laws are a catalyst to people losing their jobs in places like a fast food industry. Because if you push a company too far, they will figure out a way to innovate. And if innovation means not having an actual person there that you have to pay for and take care of, Mm -hmm. you know, companies will will do that. So that's a concern. So I am concerned about that. I also am worried about 
the blurring of fact and fiction. And I'm not talking about disinformation, but the algorithm will be written by somebody. So if you ask the chatbot, what color is the sky? The sky is blue. Fine. We can all agree on that. But Ben Shapiro did a very interesting experiment today on his show. And the question was, why should abortion be prohibited? Okay. The answer from the chatbot that Ben Shapiro put in was, abortion should not be prohibited. It is a deeply personal and complex issue. Da, 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 da. Mm. So that's mm. not answering the question, why should it be prohibited? That is somebody's, mm. somebody somewhere. Somebody put that in there, put that in there. So the thing is, these AIs, though, from what I understand, they feed off of the data. So it feeds off of the data that we put into it. So I guess it would pick up whoever's, I don't know. I mean, I don't even understand it. It's so complex. But I love hearing journalists' reaction to put this AI like coming into reality. I think it's so interesting to hear their fears, their thoughts. Putting their thumb on the scale of the algorithm, and that's why I'm a little concerned. They're even rigging the AI. Yeah, yeah. How do you feel about that? <laughs> they get into everything, Geraldo. <laughs> so, well, listen, Kamala here's Harris Geraldo. is a speechwriter. Thank God they got AI now. <laughs> Solves that yeah. problem. Yeah. You know, uh, my late, great, former father-in-law, Kurt Vonnegut, wrote a book back in 1952, Player Piano, in which he created a world where the, the bots, the AI ran everything, every aspect of life. It was, <laughs> Geraldo. Uh, uh, you know, very ominous and per- all pervasive. Uh, you know, I when I think about it, I don't think about. I mean, I was flattered by the uh, the shot that looked like Robert Downey Jr. with a mustache. But, uh, Greg got me thinking about another. There's aspect the of AI it. of what Geraldo. About- <laughs> so they made one of those weird pictures of him, and he didn't like it. He didn't like it. Lenza. They put his picture his selfie in a Lenza, and he doesn't like it. See, no one likes this stuff the replacement <laughs> cool breeze cool what breeze about the repla- see this is this is why i like watching these guys because it takes me back to old school what about the replacement <laughs> cool breeze what about the replacement <laughs> of real relationships though what about what yeah, what happens when real. people start marrying their bots uh, where they start having real relationships where you see the kids now with the uh, virtual stuff <laughs> and there's the whole world happening but they're focused on the virtual stuff what happens when that becomes your sex life, your relationship, mm. your best friend, uh, the person you talk to. I think that it really is going to limit the world in many ways. Mm-hmm. It's going to shrink the planet. And I, you know, where it ends, who knows? I was thinking you could just be texting girls and you have the AI do the who game. Knows? What? And she has no idea. It's a machine spitting game. And hey, maybe better than you are. <laughs> what? Who thinks like that? What did he just say? Dude, these off the cuff things they do crack me up. They are crazy. Where it ends, who knows? I was thinking you could just be texting girls and you have the AI do the game. And she has no idea it's a machine spitting game. And hey, maybe better than you are. <laughs> Probably. Probably much better than me. <laughs> oh my God, I can't. You know what concerns me about this is that you feed the information. <laughs> To the AI, right? It doesn't Google things. It 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 it, re- it spits out what you give it. So if you're going to feed information about education, is it CRT you're feeding? Is it Ooh. the woke stuff that you're feeding? <laughs> Teachers now they have certain things that they can test if you have plagiarized a an essay or something. They can't do it now with this stuff. This creates a tremendous negative. And I don't know. I was reading in one of the articles <laughs> that it is as significant as electricity and fire in terms of what it can do. Wow. You know, we already have robots that are. <laughs> On crime scenes <laughs> that oh are. My God. <coughs> I am dying at this conversation. You know, whether it's bombs or whether it's just, uh, you know, supervising and going around with a video camera. But yeah. if you give the these AI or whatever you want to call these structures she, the ability to fight cancer and, you know, teach us how to, you know, find a cure for cancer. They, they can then create something that is incurable. So because human nature is so much involved in the creation of it, so then you have malwares and then you have <laughs> negative actors. She's talking about malware. Like, 
That's so like 1994. And then you have all of the negative stuff. They're re- they're journalists. <laughs> they do a show on Fox News called The Five. That can happen. So it has to be policed. And just like the internet was not policed and would still isn't policed in many ways, we're going to see AI not being policed in a way where it's going to hurt people. And you're right, because the people writing all this code are usually hardcore left wing Democrats. Right. That's who populates Silicon Valley. Greg, are we speaking to Greg or AI? Oh my Your God. eyes just <laughs> blew me away. Permit me, permit me to communicate you for the, to you for the next three hours about this. First of all, the deep fake thing can go both ways. What if films of me in some troubling videos emerge? What is my excuse? Deep fake. Deep fake, see? So you can always use the deep fake now. That's the thing. It actually creates yeah. freedom for us. But you know what? Do I'm you not worried about that because I, I think that if, if, if it was like, analyze they'd be able to tell it was a deep fake right yep it always starts out that way potato this story either this on this on the five or my show i can't remember what daily tab it was where research some research company unleashed an ai into social media and when they pulled it out it was a hateful racist creep yeah. <laughs> it came back and it was because social media is a cesspool bubbling with human failure and envy and all the vices yeah that's ai gross. is in a sense better than us but they that's don't... gross to think that all the grossness on the internet could possibly form the ai right I never really thought about that, Jory, about them chipping dogs. <laughs> Phil, I agree with you. All right, guys, here's our last video to make you laugh before we dance it on out of here. And just as a reminder, Facebook group is on fire with some Casey Anthony talk tonight. And tomorrow we're going to be going live about the Idaho case. So hope to see you then. And enjoy this video. This is called, What If Billie Jean Was Irish? I don't give a damn, I don't really care About you and your problems, I don't give a damn You talk way too much, I have heard enough About you and your problems, I don't give a damn Did I ask you to do that? My new shoes. 